Um, this book follows a narrative arc. It really is about the dissolution of my marriage and sort of the, um, the putting back together of my self and my identity post romantic disaster of which my divorce was the beginning of a long string of them. So um, <laughs> the book is in two parts, but I think I'm just going to skip around and give you all a taste. But if you were to buy the book, there is a character called the Navy wife who predominates the first half of the book. And then in the second half, um, it's sort of like the emergence of a new identity and self, the person who I probably needed to be all along but didn't have the courage to be when I was uh, young and getting married. So I'm going to start with a poem called Pistol of Bones um, toward the beginning of the book. And I will start my, my clock too. I am gonna try to stay somewhere within that 10 minute mark. <laughs> Pistol of Bones. I live in, a, I'm sorry. Nope. Okay. Pistol of Bones. I live in a greenhouse on First Street, like a figment passing through rooms, almost less than plaster and lath, coarse hair smoothed into walls. Pine trees felled a hundred years before I drank the sun and rain, rooted deep in silence and sleep. Married to a man who flooded our bedroom each night, never sat at the table to eat, nor took his pleasure in me. Listen to the way O oh, is the surprise we know with our mouths. My moon, my cottage, my storms that blew acorns onto the tin roof. I measured and so my days together, floral and nothing I would buy again or hang myself in a new life the one without a man, the one where I understand the marrow of words tastes nothing like the marrow of bones. So that's sort of one of the Navy wife poems. A little bit later on, this is during the marriage. This poem is called, When the Mississippi Speaks with Its Wet Pretty Mouth. And the, it's a, a running title, so it moves right into the first line of the, of the poem. So I'll reread the title to start the poem. When the Mississippi speaks with its wet, pretty mouth, a string of vowels comes out, silty tongue curling under and around the dark outside the high life bar that backs up to this brackish curl of coast. You need a passport to come this far south where men with flashlights wade knee deep with spears flick them into dark so their small beacons appear to nod like drunken heads. I watch for silhouettes, men gigging for flounder that lie flat in mud they've burrowed under with one eye facing up to stars. Out beyond the naked bay, past Christiane in the grip of old growth pines, once felled for floors, now in turn of century homes, full of double hung windows the preservation society adores. I'm with my husband who's ordered another Michelob Ultra as I finger a fried pickle out of the plastic basket lined with wax paper, now translucent with grease. He asks if I want another, if I want to dance upstairs then stares at the lights of a few distant Gulf shrimp boats where the hearts of a few men bob. They're trawling for someone else's dinner throwing back rusted cans and garfish while upstairs the bartender calls me little lady. And I am still when my husband grabs and flings the ring toss game on its string. I am remembering the antique fan I'd brought from Boston, which he carried to the attic because it was too rustic. The bicycle I rode through Nova Scotia, which my father, with my father, excuse me, he put out with the trash when I went home to visit my mother. Just a ring on a dingy string, we watch its elliptical flight, how it seeks the clink of collision. I think about how my name is no longer my name and how I am full of the same old dumb luck that sent me up the aisle at 28, though he did not know how I was afraid to be alone. Another quarter dropped in the, into the jukebox slot. The air along the gulf is stagnant, hot, my hair pinned up off my nape. And he's not touched me in several nights, not a wrist or hip, 
but I am all right with how we shift in bed after the lights go out. Listen as the distant train approaches the trestle over the bay and soon we'll walk out to our car. I'll take the keys, but only after we've chugged another each. Listen as records shift and drop, Etta James begins to sing, her voice moving east to then self like a knife through me. Like I'm some small town with the word pearl in it, then Slidell over denim colored Lake Pontchartrain, its palms open, how it rises each time it rains. And there once, how a woman flashed a gun at me on I-10 as I'd merged speeding into her lane. So I'll try to um, skip ahead a little bit and uh, move into a poem where I'm sort of trying to get back out there after my divorce. This poem is called After Joining OK Cupid. I'd like to confess that dating four men at once is kind of awesome. The way the heart knows how to expand and break off into knowledgeable pieces occurs quite naturally. And because one of the men happens to be a microeconomist who studies game theory, I've begun to consider the nature of scarcity, how I am like a commodity where desire is the only available currency. And since another is a translator, I'll ask, how do I say the heart is a vagrant in Polish and he might reply in the spirit of love and conversion that I must loiter long enough in a foreign territory to understand the principles at play. The other two, a musician and a biologist have led me to expect that by the end of the month, I'll have found that the best way for the body to hold its own concert is by singeing all my organs simultaneously through the fire of orgasm. However, if this seems like too much information, Try disconnecting from your deepest sense of longing long enough to take in the world at its pleasurable best. After all, our planet is something like a cruise ship with its Midwest buffets of grain and its lit up cities that bi-coastally drift on the plate of our hemisphere. You've seen those NASA satellite pictures of Earth from space, how we're congealed in darkness like a terabyte of light bulbs tossed in the air. It can make you wanna catch your breath, the beauty of the cosmos, or just some new stranger standing in front of you in his underpants. I have to say that my professor helped me write that last line. Um, I'll, I'll read the poem that uh, kind of begins my real devolvement into some uh, deep spiritual grief. <laughs> and this was also the poem that was um, chosen by Meridian uh, for their 2018 prize. I can still remember where I was when I wrote it. I was, I was staying, sitting in my graduate cubic, pu cubicle at Florida State, um, getting ready to teach class, I think. And I just uh, kept reworking the lines of this poem. It's called, It's Not an Apocalypse If the Horses Are Mortal. And again, it's a running title, so I'll read that right into the first line. It's not an apocalypse if the horses are mortal or if they arrive several nights in a row. It will only begin when I am ready to walk out of my body. It's slow trailer of dark hitched to my every move, night pushing me around, trying to get rid of me. Feed your darkness, it says, know your hunger, fingering my mind, touching the shelves like a butcher, darkness sliced, cut into even slices. I began to surround myself with things that were not my own, to enter other people's lives, study their objects, imagine who they loved and why. It was a slow stroke I'd make over the skin of their existence, the way I'd always imagined God did to me when I was sleeping, the way I begged him to be near me. Several times I nested my desire for God inside the men I'd sleep with, but like him, I'd forget their faces, remembering only a blot of ink, a swirl of hair. My habit was to take something of theirs to hold on to. For one, the shape of his loneliness, for another, a lighter blue plastic flicked by a thumb that had been in my mouth only moments before. I was trying to forget who I'd been, sitting with my thighs crossed, switching on the light until I could bite it in two. 
I imagined the sun was as real as an empty bed, a shovel. Then I knew all the right steps to take. First, remove the thumb from your mouth. First, ask where else the bodies are hidden. First, make a fist with your hand and strike wildly. First, bring it into a field, lay it down, shove a clean rag in its mouth, douse it in gasoline. Crouch over it in the dry grass, flicking the flame of a bick, arousing it over and over. See its eyes reflect the heat, the warmth. Then watch how fire can kick. Watch it buck. So, you know, really happy at that point in my life. <laughs> and uh, let's see, I'll end with... Hmm. Tempted to read another Mississippi poem, but I think I will read another funny one just because that was pretty, pretty dark. <laughs> and this is, this is, I have to read this. Oops, I guess that's my time. Can I do one more? Should I? Oh, please. Yeah, don't, I, I feel like I was maybe overzealous or, or, or a, a worded something too strongly in my email about time frames. Please <laughs> don't be so stressed about it. Okay, last one, last one. Um, this is called Anti-Ode to Tallahassee, Florida, which is where I wrote the majority of this book. Um, and um, I will say, I will use the word suffered through my doctorate program because uh, it's a very intense process. And I think it took me about two years to come out of the burnout um, of having gone through that. Um, I see Sam gave me the double thumbs up. So yeah, <laughs> it's intense. Um, Anti-Ode to Tallahassee, Florida. Sure, there were one or two picturesque harbors if you squinted your eyes as you drove by long after midnight, so the lapping waves seemed to make an overture of love to the docks. The sailboats cheek to cheek nestled flush, their fiberglass holes scraping the buoys into a gold specked salt brine where moonlight sluiced its juice. The herons and pelicans forever strutting those Florida shores, mouthing off to manatees and though cousins of the dinosaurs, alligators with feathers between their teeth. Ungodly country, where I'd jog along sandy paths, launching myself from mile three to dancing the can-can over another slithering stick, awoken by some primordial hand of God, <clears throat> excuse me, which still works its alpha and omega on every snake between the Okefenokee swamp and Devil's Sink. The whole landscape grouchy with spiked palms and spiders the size of palms, a blast zone of leftover divine creativity, like a painter's palette of knockout colors, except for the tedium of beiges and browns and army greens, pine pollen yellows, turquoise baby blues and oysters on the half shell, rancid pilings, and aren't pelicans just the ugliest birds you've ever seen? Not a sauce in all creation could make that bird look edible. Whenever I tried to stroll or drive to the beach, every inch of me would spritz, so I'd wish again for the nucleus of home, the AC. <clears throat> Even the rain wouldn't be outdone. Storms on LSD, storm sandwiches, clouds as big as Zeus's butt cheeks, lightning bugs and their neon love abdomens. My car turned gold overnight from pine pollen, glazed with thick droplets of sap I'd remove with rubbing alcohol. The earth so sandy, it seemed a personal favor it didn't inter our whole town. Gone bird's aphrodisiac oyster shack, gone poor Paul's poor house, gone Fire Betty's arcade and railroad square, where I'd spent many a first Friday walking the small circle of your esplanade of dander and mildew crowded vintage shops. And how many food carts? Seven? And one anemic drum circle in the corner of that haven a pod of junior hippies at their spinach and bongos. And one, oh, sorry. <laughs> so what if I headed west? Can you blame me when my morning ritual was coffee, eye drops and several antihistamine? And now that I live a coast apart, I suck and savor at the bones of Tallahassee, that gobstopper of grief and overfed inbred geese that haunted Ella Lake, the thick heady scent of jasmine, honeysuckle, the inner tube of human air, the cicadas back in their offices pulling another all-nighter, the open window full of yesterday's spider webs, someone up the road playing fiddle on their porch, and whoever kept practicing in the high school batting cages, clink and clink 
They aimed into the dark, which answered back, clink, clink. Thank you.